Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. to introduce to you someone else from America who is a urologist like my husband but not like my husband because she's female and um, she's wonderful so I've got with me Dr Kelly Casperson who is a urologist who specializes in sex and hormones and helping people feel better and reduce the risk of diseases and everything else so um, I've been stalking her quite a lot on social media more than she realizes and I love her openness, I love her evidence-based approach, and I just love her way that she's just going to cut through all the noise and just get to her patients and really help. So welcome, Kelly. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor. So my husband, as, as many people know, is a urologist, and what he knows about menopause now is very different to what he knew 20 years ago or longer when we were medical students. What I know about the menopause is very different. And actually today, earlier, I was talking to an ovarian cancer charity about menopause. And I was rereading some papers that I read many years ago about um, how women after a cancer diagnosis fall off a cliff and no one talks about sex. And the majority of women do have problems with sex um, and not just sex, but sexuality, actually. And not just libido as in sex drive, but just the libido joy of life. And mm. it's awful, actually. And I, we can talk about so many things. And we're going to have to talk quickly because we've only got half an hour. But I'll probably have to get you to come back if that's OK, Kelly. But, you know, last night I was sitting there thinking, I've always been really open as a doctor. And I allow people to say exactly what they want. But actually, you have to ask the right questions. And yesterday I saw a patient of mine who had cervical cancer several years ago. She's really young. She's in her early 40s now. The cancer diagnosis was seven years ago. She's had surgery. She's had chemotherapy. She had radiotherapy. She's, I hope, cured from her cancer. Yet she doesn't think she'll ever be able to have sex again. And she's been told that things won't feel the same for her. I asked her if would you like me to examine you? And she burst into tears and said, oh my goodness, that would be amazing because it feels and looks different. I'm too scared to look. But I don't want to be 42 and never have sex again. And actually examining was really reassuring. That was easy part. But actually, this is awful. So the more I ask, the more I see, the more I hear, the more frustrated I am. And I mean, are you frustrated, Kelly, or is it just me? <laughs> Oh no! It well, I, I'm a lot more optimistic now, like five years into this journey, than I was in the beginning. In the, you know, now I'm like, because I actually see that it's getting better. I truly believe yeah. that this that there's something that's happened this year. It is getting better. But you're right. Like mm. on the importance of asking the right questions, I think that's very poignant because if you ask a woman, "Are you doing okay?" and you have a power differential, you're the doctor, she's the patient. Mm. You say, "Are you doing okay?" She wants to be doing okay. She's probably going to say, "Yeah, I'm doing fine." you're never going to know what's actually going on. Yeah. Like asking the right questions, like, you know, yeah. is, is incredibly important to hear the story. And, and the other thing I notice a lot, you know, in my clinic, because I'm more urology based, is they'll come in for the urology problem, right? Mm -hmm. Bladder leakage or urinary tract infections, right? And you ask the questions or you do an exam and you see that, you know, there's no labia minora, the clitoris is atrophied, the clitoris has phimosis so that it's covered by skin, right? And then you say, you know, do you sure you're sexually active? Uh, is it pleasurable? And then he, I've never had an orgasm in my life, right? And that's not what they came in for. They did not come in for that problem. They came in for recurrent urinary tract infections. But there's so much under the surface. Mm. 
Absolutely, and we do a, a symptom questionnaire on every patient in the clinic, and it, it talks about libido. And actually, it's a segue in, really, because they answer the questions before they come. So they know that, if appropriate, we will be talking to them. And I remember when I first started the clinic uh, seven, eight years ago, and asking women, you know, about not just about whether they feel like sex, but whether they have sex. And most women, it's at least two years that they've had sex. And I was talking to someone yesterday, and she said, do you know what? I hate sex. It just it does nothing for me. I lie there and think, oh, no, I'm going to have to go through the motions. And she said, do you think that's my hormones? And she's been married for ages. She loves her husband. I know she does. But it's that whole, like, it's awful, actually, that men are allowed to talk about sex. They can just go and buy Viagra. They can do all sorts but women, it's like shameful if we want to have pleasurable sex almost. And that's yeah. just gone on in the history of women for centuries, hasn't it? I remember, yeah, I remember talking to a, a big expert in female sexuality as I was kind of going through my journey and still learning. This is before I wrote the book. And we were talking about desire, right? And I'm like, now you're assuming the, the woman's having good sex when she's having it. And he's like, well, of course, we're assuming when she's having it, it's good sex. And I'm like, and this was a man expert. And I'm like, there's the problem, right? Because here we think like you don't desire sex, but then sex is amazing when you have it. You just don't desire the amazingness. And it's like, no, sometimes you don't desire mushy broccoli. Like, and there's nothing wrong with not desiring mushy broccoli, right? So you really do have to ask all the different questions mm -hmm. because a lot of women will come in thinking they have low desire when in fact it's incredibly painful, right? Yes. And so I tell women, like, you don't have two problems. You don't have low desire and pain. Of course, you don't desire hitting your thumb with a hammer. Mm. And that's really important, you know, especially thinking about urinary symptoms. So I see a lot of women, as I'm sure you do, who have um, urinary tract infections or cystitis after having sex. It can be very common when you've got some changes that occur when you've got low hormone levels. And it can occur when we're with contraception if their testosterone levels are low, of course. Um, and so a lot of women are so scared of having sex because they're worried about having a UTI or cystitis after. So they might find the actual sex amazing. They might have the most incredible orgasm. But if they know they're going to be blighted with getting up in the night, having cystitis, not being able to function at work, feeling in a lot of pain, discomfort, and not wanting to take antibiotics, then, and no one's talked to them, there is treatment that can prevent that, it, that will affect your experience, won't it? Oh, 100%. You start avoiding it, right? And if you start avoiding it, especially if you're not communicating with your partner about why you're avoiding it, mm. Then they have to assume because they have to try to figure it out. Does she not love me? Is she seeing somebody else? Like it goes poorly quickly, especially when we, we've never been taught how to communicate about sex, right? There's people who've been together for years who've never talked about their sex life. Everybody's just sitting around assuming things about each other. Yeah, I think the only thing that's more embarrassing to talk about than sex is money and people don't talk about what's in your bank account. But but we should be talking to our partners. And I've been horrified over the years, women telling me how painful it is, how it's just the most uncomfortable thing. It brings tears to their eyes. And yet they won't talk to their partner because they say, I know sex is really important and I know he enjoys it and I want to give him pleasure. And And I'm just like, hang on a minute. Like if he had a big sore down his penis he would be telling you, like, why yep. can't we be talking? And then it's not even just about penetrative sex or sex with another person. It's any sort of sexual pleasure. Um, and we we know, and we don't need to go into big detail because I've talked before on other podcasts about this diagnosis of HSDD, mm -hmm. it's hyperactive sexual desire disorder. Even that's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. It's, it's, I think it's actually worse than about. GSM. Yeah, it is. It's a because mouthful. we know that it affects around 25% of menopausal women from the studies. But if you look how you make the diagnosis, it's the most barbaric, old fashioned, degrading thing ever. I, I don't know about you, but you, you have to wait till women are severely affected. And it has to be for a minimum of at least three months. So you can't have two months of feeling like awful and low sexual desire, you have to wait for three months. It's so many things. I don't know yeah. what you think, but it just doesn't feel right somehow. Well, yeah, the bar is so much higher. I mean, Viagra has been around mm -hmm. uh, in the US at least since 1997, 1998. And we, mm -hmm. it's, it, it has side effects. Viagra has side effects, people. Mm -hmm. Like this is not a sugar pill. It's not without its issues. But by and large, it's, it's very safe. 
right? And we give it to men whenever they think about it, right? We're like, oh, you need just a little more confidence in the bedroom? Have some Viagra. Oh, you blah. like, we're just giving it out like it isn't anything. And I, that's the power, I would say, of the female urologists in the menopause movement. We take care of men. We know how they're treated. We don't say, I'm sorry, you're having erection issues and low energy and you have low testosterone. It's just what getting old is. Have you tried acupuncture and wine? Right. But we'll say the, that same statement to women. And I just think the gynecologists do not have that male lens that the urologists have. Yeah, that's very interesting perspective. And, and I've spoken before and Avram Blooming, who we both love and admire, talks about if you say to a man, you are going to be guaranteed to have a condition where your penis is going to shrivel, it's going to be painful to have sex and your brain will become like mush you won't be able to think properly and 10% of you will give up work because of this condition. But there's a treatment, but we're only going to give it to the minority of you. It just wouldn't happen. But especially when you focus on sex, and it's a generalization here, of course, but for many men, sex is really important. It's, a, it's really important for, for men and women and everybody, actually, um, or sexual pleasure. So why should it be stripped away from us when we become menopausal? The number of women I have messages from, and you probably do all over the world, to say, I can't find my clitoris, it's really shrunk. I am unable to orgasm. I know it's related to my hormones, but I'm not being listened to. Like, yeah. I don't really quite understand the big problem. Well, what we've done, you know, what we've done in urology is we've treated the male sexual dysfunction without addressing the partner. And 90% of men are partnered with women, right? And so now men get the good fortune of seeing me in clinic and I'm like, what's your plan? And they're like, well, I don't, they just want an erection, right? I'm like, well, you know, do, do, who, who are your partners? Do you have a partner? You got to start there. And, yep. Well, my wife. Yep. And we haven't had sex for eight years. And I'm like, is she seeing somebody? Is it painful? Have you talked about your new plan? I wish I could tell you 50% of them have talked to their partner about this. I'm at 100% that has, have not talked to their partner. And so I give them a tough time about it. I'm like, listen, you are at the doctor. You're going to get a medication that's going to make you want sex more and have a better working penis. And you've not communicated that to the person you want to use your penis with? Sorry for being crude, the UK, the, the Americans on. No, it's, but, it's absolutely but it drives home a point. Yeah. And it's very important. So my husband is, you might know, a genital urinary reconstructive surgeon. So he will rebuild penises often when there's been trauma or um, other conditions. And but often the male and female partner will come in together and he'll more in increasingly look at the woman, especially if she is of a menopausal age, and say directly, have you had any, have you any discomfort problems? Or da, da. And the man's like, hang on, this is my consultation. He said, no, you've already talked about, you know, sex and da, da, how important it is to be able to use your penis in that way. And the women are so relieved, like their shoulders just go down inches. And he says, I'll write to the doctor and see if they can prescribe you some vaginal hormones. And it's like, Paul, this is amazing. You'd never have done this five, 10 years ago. He said, no, I didn't think because I've just been blinkered thinking about the man. But actually, I realized from talking to you and actually the response I get from the women is huge. And that's one of the sort of throwbacks about Viagra and Cialis and, and these drugs is that the more they're used, wonderful. But then it's unmasking these women who might have thought their urinary tract infections was an aging related thing. They might have not really thought that they had any problems with their vulva or vagina or surrounding tissues. But then when they have sex, my goodness, it's really uncomfortable. But they think it's because they haven't used it for a long time. That's right. Um, yeah. So I mean, one of one of my platforms, yeah. as you know, is that a, a penis will not fix a hormone problem. This this myth of use it or lose it. Right. Is mm. is from a very old gynecology study that was correlation, oh, not causation. Terrible, but I yeah. still hear it. You just oh, use it all day, every day. It. It's or, all over the or, internet. Yeah, or then you just get some dilators and just use those, and that really doesn't feel right. So we're talking about hormones now. We've always been naively taught that estrogen is the most important hormone. We have progesterone just to protect the lining of the womb. And there's a bit of sort of chatter about testosterone, but that's the male hormone. Now, the more I read about physiology of hormones, um, and I've read some amazing papers recently, 
all three hormones are really important, actually. Progesterone is not just to protect the lining of our womb. Our brain produces it as well as our ovaries. It's very anti-inflammatory. has really important biological effects. Oestrogen is important. And testosterone is important. But we've always been taught the menopause is when our oestrogen levels decline and our periods stop. But what about testosterone levels? They, they're not all in line with each other, these hormones. So, and, and we have testosterone receptors on our vulva, our vagina, our perineum, our pelvic floor, our, our urinary tract. So why are we saying, have your estrogen, make sure you're well estrogenized, and then think about testosterone if you've got severe psychological distress with your reduced libido? Like, I yeah. don't quite understand. Is that the same for you over in the yeah. US that you have to well, do that? Absolutely. I mean, and, and to step it, uh, you know, out another 10,000 10, foot view is we have m more hormones than those three. We've got tons of hormones. Those are just the only three that we know how to test and actually have a medication for. Yeah. Right. And I like to say that to be like, you guys, we are, we're going to look back at this era as like bloodletting with leeches. We are doing the okay. best we can with a little bit of information. But what we did is we gendered the hormones. We said estrogen is female, testosterone is male. And once we gendered that, we made it disappear from 50% of the population. I actually Googled the other day. I'm like, Google, what's an androgen? And it says the male hormone responsible for male sexual traits is kind of what Google told me. So I'm like, we've got a lot of work to do to get all the hormones back in the bodies. And I, this is a, a meaningful thing that I do. So I see a postmenopausal woman in clinic. She's with her male partner. And I'm talking to her about hormones and why they're important. So I point at him and I say, do you know that his estrogen is higher than yours right now? And it blows their freaking mind for multiple reasons because the man doesn't think he has estrogen, right? And then now her estrogen is lower than his. It's like, that's, you guys, our education is so poor. Mm. It's really interesting because even um, my mother, who is well educated, but she's not medical, we don't come from medical backgrounds, said to me a few years ago, I didn't realize that people have hormones in their bodies. I just thought hormones was just HRT. Oh. So then I thought, oh gosh, and I oh, have been a that's medical insightful. writer for many years. Yeah. And I remember years ago writing about cancer and interviewing some people because this was before the internet. I'm saying, what's cancer? And they said, that means death. And I thought, hang on, no, it doesn't. But who's taught them? No one's taught them. You pick and it's just like anything. You learn from whatever you read or what your best friend tells you. And so then I'm thinking more and more about hormones. You're absolutely right, Kelly, because we've got hundreds, thousands of hormones in our body. And they work so beautifully to help our bodies to function because they're just these chemical messengers. But then they've been defined as sex hormones. Well, they're not all about sex because we've already said they regulate every single cell process, actually. But then, and they're not about gender either, because we've already said women have testosterone and men have estrogen. But then actually people talk about ovarian hormones because apparently the menopause is when we haven't had a period or we're not fertile, but I don't really like those definitions. And they're not just ovarian hormones. We've already said they're produced in other areas of our body. Yeah. So yeah. why are we trying to put them into this box? and? You know, um, it's a real problem when we trying to dispel all these myths and talk about how testosterone can improve brain function, not just about libido, or we're talking about estradiol reducing risk of cardiovascular disease and being a vasodilator and lowering blood pressure. People who have never thought beyond the ovaries are like, wow, hang on, I don't understand well, how this is happening. And yeah. then if people don't know that our hormones are natural, that they're going in our bloodstream and they're doing this all the time when we're younger, then it, it's quite hard to understand as well. It's, yeah. I mean, I can it, see where, why we've got in this mess, but we need to unpick it, don't we, to help more Yeah. People. And I think it starts with education. I got, I was at this symposium in New York City this past week and somebody said, does the pain with sex end when menopause is done? And so to me, I'm like, okay, we got to, you have to go back to the basics, right? Mm -hmm. you, you are in a low hormone state for the rest of your life, unless yeah. you take a medication. And even like, you know, even ridiculous to me, people are like, don't call menopause a deficiency. We don't like how it sounds. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry you don't like how it sounds. You, you let other people know how you want it. But when a woman is walking around with less hormones than any man, like, compared to how she was functioning when she was saying she was functioning at her best, what do you want me to call that? If you don't want me to call that a deficiency of what her other baseline was. 
It's really interesting, isn't it? I spoke to someone at the Royal College of GPs about eight years ago, and I was probably more gobby than I am now. Maybe I'm the same. I don't know. But I, I anyway, I contacted them and said, how do you change the name of something? I would like to change the name of menopause to female hormone deficiency, so FHD. And Ooh. they were like, oh, my goodness. And I said, because once you start talking about deficiency, you're immediately thinking, how do I replace that? So if I said to you, Kelly, you're iron deficient, I think the first question you would say to me if I was your physician, oh, how do I get more iron? Is it in my diet? Do I take a supplement or whatever? Yeah, so I wouldn't say you so, offended me, right? Yeah. Like where people are getting yeah, offended about this. Yeah, Precisely. And so if I'm thinking about a female hormone deficiency, and I know it's a bit crass saying female hormones, but if we, because, you know, or an estrogen deficiency and a testosterone deficiency and a progesterone deficiency, they're all different because some people, certainly in our clinical experience, benefit most from testosterone and least from estrogen or the other way around. Or they benefit mm -hmm. from all three because they all work together in a beautiful way. Everyone's different. So that's fine, yep. but we can't just be calling it menopause and periods. It doesn't, doesn't, just doesn't it covers up. Yeah. It covers up what's going on. Right. Um, mm. yeah, it's, it's the, the, the deficiency. I think they, I think they don't want, cause some people can't take hormones currently and I think they don't want them to feel bad. But to me, I'm like, but the 97% of women who can take hormones safely, yeah. like we need to educate them about what's actually going on in their body. Cause if you yeah, say I mean, menopause, yeah. it doesn't explain what's going on. No. And I think that's really important because we don't know who can and can't take hormones. There isn't enough evidence. And actually, the more I read, estrogen, obviously, we know is not just one thing. It's, it's, there's estradiol and estrone. And estrone is the pro-inflammatory part of estrogen that our fat cells produce that mm -hmm. um, some oral estrogen is broken down to. And I've been reading some really good papers looking at the pathophysiology behind breast cancer and it's more estrone driven than estradiol yep. driven thank you for saying that realizing that yeah so yep. so it's really important and we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes for women who've had breast cancer trying to really unpick this evidence because for them to be told they can never have estrogen actually is denying them from lots of benefits without knowing whether it they probably can't have estrone but mm -hmm. they probably can have estradiol. We don't know, but this needs to be done urgently to look. But actually, every time I put something on my Instagram to say menopausal women have an increased risk of heart disease, there's always two or three women will go, that's really scaremongering. Please stop talking like this. But that's like saying, if you've got raised blood pressure, you've got an increased risk of a heart attack or stroke. It's just fact. Like right. I am just a messenger for a lot of this. And I think it's blowing people's minds because they've just thought about HRT is dangerous. Hormones are something that we may or may not need. And menopause is just a natural state. But actually, we've got to think beyond because I worry as I'm sure you do, about population health and looking mm -hmm. at all those diseases that are affecting us, not just killing us, but affecting the way we function um, and live. And a lot of those diseases are the inflammatory diseases that increase when we don't have our hormones. And I think if we know that more as menopause or perimenopausal women, then we can make a choice that's right for us. But we yeah. can't make a choice on our treatment if we don't know all the facts. I see a lot of women say, well, I want to take, I want to do something natural. I want to do something natural. And to yeah, me, I'm like, I, 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 I've looked at the data. I've looked at the death records uh, that the world's kept, right? We are at an unprecedented time where we've never lived this long as a global community mm. ever before. We are literally writing the rules for how to age well. We've never done this before, right? So I would say aging like this, is not natural. It's never been done before. Infectious diseases and blunt trauma killed everybody before the age of 50, mm -hmm. except for the outliers. And my second natural comeback would say, people are like, I want to do it naturally. I want to do it natural. Giving yourself hormones that your body makes, they're identical, is as, as natural as you can get. And we have data to show those women are actually going to take less other medications, less antidepressants, less high blood pressure medications, less other things for their bones because they're taking a hormone that's natural. It's the most natural thing that we can do to keep you off other medications. 
You're, you're totally right. I did a, a, a lecture last week for the Football Association, actually, with women's football, because I really like what they what they stand for, and I'm, you know, we're doing the same with how we're helping women, of course. But the doctor there, who was fantastic, I think I blew his mind because he'd only been taught that HRT is dangerous and it causes breast cancer. So then he said, "Well, we need another randomised control study, Louise, don't we? Otherwise, we'd never know the, the benefits. And what if there's a study in the future which shows how dangerous hormones are?" Which was a great question but firstly doing a randomized control study a is really expensive and no one will spend money on women b it doesn't have to be not everything is done with a randomized control study penicillin wasn't found with a randomized control study also it wouldn't be ethical to deny people an evidence-based treatment for a study if you're looking at dementia risk you're going to have to wait decades and we'll be dead by then sorry kelly but you know if we did that sort of study but also i said to him regardless of the evidence it's just natural hormones. So why would we have hormones that would suddenly turn against us? It, it just doesn't make sense. Like, I've never known this narrative about anti-hormones with insulin. Thyroxine, there's always a bit of debate about T4 and T3 and the different types of thyroid hormones. But we, we don't unpick the evidence or try and sensationalize the evidence about natural hormones for anything else. And so why would it be dangerous? It just doesn't make sense if you think yeah. basic physiological processes, does it? I agree. In the urology world, prostate cancer is a big, big cancer, right? Which is fascinating. Uh, if you look at testosterone treatment in prostate cancer survivors, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have me back for this, but it's an allegory for what's going to happen yes. with breast cancer. Mark my word, I'm seeing it coming because I've lived, yeah, I've absolutely. lived through the testosterone fear with prostate cancer. And now we're like, hey, you have prostate cancer and it's mild and you want testosterone? Great. 10 years ago, you couldn't touch this stuff. We've come a long way. But to go back to the randomized control trial, with prostate cancer, you can get radiation or you can get surgery if your prostate cancer is bad enough to be treated. We've never done a randomized control trial. We never will do a randomized control trial because we need to treat guys and it would take decades to do. And we don't tell guys, well, we're just not going to treat you because we don't know which one's best. Yeah. We don't say that. We say there's risks yeah. and benefits. Let's, yeah. let's pick one. Yeah. We'll never have a randomized control trial. We're not going to sit around and wait. We're going to treat you. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to some people not so long ago who are very anti the work that I'm doing. And we were, they were talking about the percentage of women that should be taking HRT. And they said, in the UK, 14% of women take, UK, take HRT. And they said, that's probably too high. And I said, well, in areas of deprivation, it's as low as 2%. And they said, well, maybe we should go back to doing that. <gasps> and then I said, I don't actually care Dr. the percentage. I think it should be a lot higher. But in my mind, 100% of women who want to have HRT, which is an evidence-based treatment, should be allowed to have it first choice before being offered SSRIs or whatever else they're offered. And so this is exactly the same with prostate cancer or anything we do in medicine. It's about choice, informed consent, sharing uncertainty, sharing benefits, sharing potential risks and listening to what the patient wants at that time. Now, until that happens, I can't shut my mouth because I'm hearing all the time from women all across the world who are struggling to access hormones. So yeah. it just seems such a frustrating narrative, actually. It's insane. 25% of American women in midlife are on an SSRI. And I always say, D we need to treat depression. Absolutely. But the amount of people who say they're treating my menopause symptoms with this and it's not helping, right? Mm. Of like, and those medications have significant risks, right? Here we are. Here here we are saying hormones are so unsafe. We give unsafe medications every day and don't think about it. We know there's risks to them. Why, why are we so unique with this hormone discussion? It, it doesn't make sense, does it? Because, um, you know, we know that, for example, SSRIs increase risk of osteoporosis. We know not That's having right. HRT increases the risk of osteoporosis. You've got double whammy, actually. And we also know that the mortality after an osteoporotic prick fracture is about 20% in a year. Mm -hmm. So if, if you'd been diagnosed with some really aggressive cancer, there's not many that would kill 20% of people in a year. Whereas an osteoporotic hip fracture, people go, oh, that's a bit of a shame, but it's just osteoporosis, isn't it? Actually, yeah. no, let's wake up to the fact that, you know, these conditions can be really, really affect people. It's a very painful way to die.
by the way, it's, it's very, it's very horrible to watch somebody go through that. That, you know, and I think a lot of people don't know that. And I, I want to mention that in case anybody missed it. The SSRIs have an increased risk of fracture. I did not know that. I asked my family practice friend. She did not know. I asked my orthopedic surgeon friend. He did not know. We don't communicate. The, then there's been decades of research on this. Nobody's talking about this risk. So we, th we think, right. you know, hormones are so scary. And we're like 25% of the U.S. population, female in midlife, are on a drug that increases your risk of bone fracture. And nobody knows that. Well, that's right. And, and there are, is some studies, now it's observational studies, which we know are not great, showing there's increased risk of cancer with some SSRIs. Now, it's not been replicated, but actually when you look at the methodolog methodological approaches for those studies, it's very similar to ones that have done in the past for HRT, like the Million Women study, that people still still report and still can't back on. So you've got like double standards of, of the, the studies that you use. You know, there was one um, a, a, a re review recently, an observational study for Alzheimer's and HRT. It was in the British Medical Journal. It wasn't a great study. Even the conclusion said we cannot say whether it's cause or effect. It might be association. You've got Lisa Moscone's work, fantastic. That doesn't get in any of the papers. They just want to talk about the, the risk. But if that risk for SSRI and cancer with the same sort of methodological approach, that's never mentioned. You know, or like you say, the osteoporosis risk, which is more out there, is still never mentioned. And it, it's like you can't have one rule for one and one rule for the other. Treat all drugs right. the same. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, the uh, cholesterol lowering medications are not without risks. They're the most common medication prescribed in this country, right? Mm. And cholesterol, we know cholesterol goes up in, in the postmenopause. So yeah, I, I mean, I think of the work you're doing, the work I'm doing is like education, education. This is what I know. Women are smart. When given the information, they make exceptional decisions about their healthcare. The education piece is missing. Once they get educated, they're going to want hormones. The doctors need to get ready. Our healthcare systems and your healthcare system too is already full and, and spilling out the sides. We're so busy and so full. And the, I'm telling you, these women are coming. They need people to take care of them. Absolutely. You're so right. So thank you ever so much. Lots to think about. And we are, I am going to have to ask you to come back. Don't you worry. So before we finish, there's always three take home tips. Um, there's so many tips really but three three things let's go back to sex because I'm not scared or embarrassed and you certainly aren't either talking about sex so three things if people are listening and thinking do you know what I need to sort out my sex life but I've not done it and I'm ignoring it but I still love or adore my partner whatever three things that you think they should do learn how to communicate the communication is huge is like, you know, and I realized that because I'm like, I can make your pelvis pretty functional, but if you can't talk about your sex life, I haven't helped you. The communication, lubrication is everybody's friend. It only makes things better. And vaginal estrogen is everybody's friend. Very good. Very easy tips, actually. But the first one is probably the hardest is, is talking. And probably the most the right important. People. And it is the most important without a shadow of a doubt. So look, keep the conversation going. And thanks. I've really enjoyed today. It's been brilliant. Thanks, Kelly. Th thanks for having me. You can find out more about Newson Health Group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.